What's up everyone, it's Matt Martin with The Grass Factor and today I wanted to start with our first installment of interpreting, reading, digesting labels. Uh, in the previous video I had showed Momentum FX2 so that's exactly where we're going to start. I want to preface this by saying that some items in a label can be difficult to interpret. Um, there is a certain level of decision making that is placed on the applicator that acts as a, a judgment call you have to make whether or not it's applicable to your situation. In each case may vary lawn by lawn, site by site. And so hopefully we'll run into some of those instances today as we look at this. Uh, but again, um, we're gonna go through this and uh, see what we can at least get figured out here. Um, clearly you had the name of the product here at the top and then this is a pretty important part in the following line, which is, for the control of annual and perennial broadleaf weeds and ornamental turf. So this tells us two things. One, we can use it on ornamental turf. Uh, two, it controls broadleaf weeds. So we know we can spray it on uh, turf grass and we know we can spray it on broadleaf weeds. It doesn't tell us whether we can use it on um, residential turf. So we will hopefully run into that a little later in the label. Um, then we have our uh, active ingredients, 2,4-D, triclopyr, and fluoroxapyr. Um, we have a breakdown of what percent active ingredient makes up the percent of the total product. Then we have our weight equivalents in the product. Uh, so, you know, you can see here we've got, you know, two and a quarter pound. Uh, and this is... Uh, as of the AOAC method. So uh, as you convert it from an ester-based product to um, an amine or acid-based product. Um, we have here, it tells you you cannot use it if you are not a commercial applicator. And it also says you cannot use it in Nassau or Suffolk County in New York. This doesn't state that you have to have a restricted use license in order to utilize this product, but it does say you have to be a licensed commercial applicator in order to apply this product. And then of course, in big and bold levels, uh, letters we see, uh, keep out of reach of children, which is gonna be on pretty much any label. Uh, and then also uh, danger. Danger is what's known as a signal word and danger will give you the answer as to what the LD50 is, and an LD50 is the lethal dose required to kill 50% of the test subjects that usually deals with mice or rats. So we know that because it is a danger signal word, the LD50 will kill 50% of the test subjects, test rats, um, at, a, at a very specific dose. Um, we got some precautionary statements here, hazard to humans and domestic animals. Okay, now what this is talking about is uh, this particular concentrated material. So this isn't talking about it in solution, this is talking about the, the concentrated material. It's corrosive, it can cause irreversible eye damage, and it can be harmful as swallowed. Do not get in eyes or on clothing. So when you're dealing with this, um, concentrated material you have to be very careful because it does pose a hazard personal uh, PPE personal protective equipment this is section is going to be on every label out there for the most part I've yet to come across one that doesn't have it and as we can see here mixers loaders applicators and other handlers must well must wear long sleeve shirt and long pants shoes and socks plus chemical resistant gloves, and a chemical resistant apron when mixing or loading, cleaning up spills or equipment, or otherwise exposed to the concentrate, plus protective eyewear. And I will say from a professional standpoint, we do not wear chemical aprons enough. And uh, you see here, specifically on the label, it's stated as such, it must be done. Um, in here, the engineering controlled statement, when handlers use closed systems or enclosed cabs, you may not need the same PPE as when you are mixing it or spraying it in open air. Uh, sometimes it may be reduced. So if you're in a fully enclosed system, it may depend on the ventilation in it. So you may be in an enclosed system, but you may have to wear a respirator there. So 
Um, it's just one thing to pay attention to. And again, typically that's going to deal with agriculture. Safety recommendations. I think this is good pretty much for just any herbicide that's out there. You know, wash your hands before eating, drinking, chewing gum, or using tobacco, or using the toilet if you use this product. Remove clothing if pesti pesticide gets inside. Same with your PPE. Wash thoroughly. If it gets on skin, wash immediately. Remove PPE immediately after handling this product. Wash your gloves after you handle the product. Simple, basic, but important things to follow. This first aid here, sometimes this does change, but so it is worth paying attention to it. If you get it in your eyes, hold the eyes open and wash gently with water for 15 and 20 minutes. That's pretty standard. Remove contact lenses if present after the first five minutes, then continue rinsing eyes. So if you wear contacts, wash for five minutes, then remove your contacts, and then keep uh, rinsing your eye. And call a poison control center. So you're handling concentrate, you get it in your eye, uh, be careful. You may need to call a poison control center. If you swallow it, call a poison control center or doctor immediately for treatment advice. Whew. Have a person sip a glass of water. Sometimes they may ask you to sip milk. It's important to pay attention here. Do not induce vomiting unless told to do so by a poison control center. Do not give anything by mouth to an unconscious person. You can cause them to drown. Um, it gives you your hotline number and note to physician, probable mucosal damage and contraindicate of use of gastric lavage. So that tells you it's going to damage uh, mucus tissues and uh, gastric lavage. I don't know. That's, that's outside. That's a note to a physician. I'm not a physician, so I'm not even going to go down there. Environmental hazards. This is a good one here. I think it's important to be talked about. This product may be toxic to fish and aquatic invertebrates. So when we're deciding on where we're going to apply this product, we do not want to be applying it close to streams or waterways that run into bigger waterways because it can be toxic to fish. If you have high water tables or surface water, that means this product can drift with it. Drift or runoff may be hazardous to aquatic organisms and water adjacent to treated areas. Do not contaminate water when disposing of equipment, wash waters, or rinse. So you're rinsing out your jugs to dispose of them. You are um, rinsing out your uh, backpack after you make an application. You're rinsing out your, your big 250-gallon uh, spray tank. Do not dispose of your wash water or rinse it in such a way that it will contaminate other water. Uh, this chemical has properties and characteristics associated with chemicals detected in groundwater. The use of this product in areas where soils are permeable, particularly where the water table is shallow, may result in groundwater contamination. So they're saying that it can move easily with water because it has properties and characteristics similar with water. Application around a cistern or well may result in contamination in drinking water or groundwater. Keep that in mind. Directions for use. Now, this is a pretty generic precautionary statement here right off the top that says read entire label for using and follow the label with strict rules and, and accordances. Um, let's see, it should be used in accordance with drift and runoff precautions on this label in order to minimize offsite exposure. Under some conditions, this product may have potential to run off to surface water or adjacent land. Where possible, use methods which reduce soil erosion, such as no-till, limited till, and contour plowing. That's mainly for agriculture, right? Um, where feasible, use application techniques such as T-banding or in furrow techniques, again, uh, to incorporate the pesticide in the soil, again, for um, agriculture. Use of vegetation filter strips along rivers, creeks, streams, wetlands, etc. on the down hillside of the fields where runoff could occur will minimize water runoff as recommended. So it's saying if you have an open waterway that this could potentially run to, plant a buffer strip. Put you some, uh, some perennials in. Do not apply this product in a way that will contact workers or other persons, either directly or through drift. Only protected handlers may be in the area during application. So if someone comes out to you while you're treating your yard, while you're treating a yard or spraying your yard to ask you questions, do not let them come to you. Stop them where they are and tell them you're making an application. 
please do not come outside. If you need to talk to me, I can come back to you at the end of this application. This is per the law, according to the label right here. Then we're gonna move on to our agricultural use requirements. We are not using this for agriculture, so this is something you could whoop, pass right over. Um, Non-agricultural use requirements. This would apply to us, right? Since we are applicators making the application to potentially home lawns, right? And uh, you know, this is basically saying it's not within the WPS, but do not enter or allow people or pets to enter the treated area until sprays have dried. So when you're making your application and someone asks you, how long do I need to stay off the yard? Right here, the statement says, do not come back onto the yard until the spray has dried. Uh, this product is a broad spectrum herbicide for control of actively growing annual and perennial broadleaf weeds. It is for use on established ornamental turf lawns. And it specifies in this label, residential, industrial, and institutional parks, cemeteries, athletic fields, roadsides, golf courses, fairways, aprons, roughs. Also, no greens. Also for use on side farms. Do not use on golf greens or tees. Your ultra low heights of cut. Um, and then it tells you which turf grasses it can be applied to. Bent grass with a note. Do not apply to turf grass species unless potential turf grass injury can be tolerated. When treating these turf grass species, do not apply more than three pints per acre. To minimize grass injury, additional applications should be made at least four weeks apart. Avoid swath overlap. So it's saying here you can, but it's going to cause damage, and that must be an acceptable amount of, of damage that only you know the answer as to whether or not it's tolerable. You have to make that judgment call over whether or not it's worth applying this to bent grass. Only you can know what's tolerable damage. And then it also says it gives you a rate limit, three pints per the acre. Also, if you're going to run sequential applications, they need to be made at least four weeks apart. You can also apply it to Kentucky Blue, your fescue varieties, and perennial ryegrass. And then we move into warm, gra uh, warm season grass, and you see much of the same thing. Notes here that you need to be careful on your warm season grasses. And then there's a little double cross down uh, for established warm season grasses. Do not treat warm season turf grass with this product when mowing height is less than a half inch. So the stress, the conditions of mowing less than a half inch would inhibit you from being able to apply this fertilizer. And then there's a note here. This product may discolor and or stunt turf that is not well established or stressed or weakened due to unfavorable climatic conditions, temperature extremes, drought, nematodes, or other factors which can damage or weaken turf. Apply this product only to healthy, well established turf that has been has a well anchored root system. Do not apply this product to grass species not listed on this label unless potential turf injury can be tolerated. Again, this is telling you it has to be a jam up yard. It has to be under a good fertility program. It has to have adequate watering. If not, you are going to cause damage. This is a CYA statement from the manufacturer. I believe New Farm is actually the manufacturer of this product. And they include this because so many applicators will go out and spray 300 yards in a day. And uh, the problem is, is that 60% of them may be drought stress and then damage occurs. And then they go to the manufacturer and they say, I sprayed your product. I used it in the label rate, but it caused damage. Well, um, if they applied it to a yard with drought stress, this basically is a CYA move from New Farm uh, to say, yeah, well, you weren't supposed to apply it to drought stress yard. So again, it's a little protection for the manufacturer. Um, use precautions. This one is pretty uh, important too because it's going to tell you about the things that can happen, different situations that have been noticed with it. Do not apply this product directly to or otherwise permit drift spray mist come in contact with, with cotton, citrus, grapes, tobacco, vegetables, flowers, ornamental plants, shrubs, trees, or other desirable plants. Do not apply to exposed roots of shallow rooted trees and shrubs. Maximum kill of weeds will be attained from spring or early fall applications when weeds are actively growing. Do not apply more than four pints per acre per application. Mow newly seeded turf at least twice before treatment with this product. So the label tells you here that you need to make sure you've mowed your grass twice before you can apply it. 
It gives you a rate maximum, four pints per acre. If you apply it to exposed roofs of trees and shrubs, there is a potential for you to kill them. Does that mean it's going to kill them? No, but you have to understand that root is there. Uh, if drift potentially could come in contact with ornamental plants, shrubs, trees, uh, flowers, vegetables, there is a p probability that it could kill that too. So you have to exercise judgment there. For optimum results, avoid applying during excessively dry or hot periods unless irrigation is used. Turf should not be mowed one to two days before and following the application. That's an important one. Turf should not be mowed one to two days before and following application. Failing to follow that part of the label means you are inheriting a certain amount of risk to your turf grass when choosing to use this product. Reseed no sooner than three to four weeks after application of this product. There's your reseed interval. Do not apply when weather conditions favor drift from target area. Maybe a certain amount of heat, that may be a certain amount of wind, that may be a certain amount of humidity. Clean and rinse spray equipment using soap or detergent and water. So when you clean it, this is specifically telling you not just water, but soap or detergent and water. And rinse thoroughly before you reuse for other spraying. Do not apply this product through any type of irrigation system. Hopefully nobody is doing that. Spray drift management. This can be important because we're talking about uh, uh, phenoxy-based herbicides, synthetic auxins. These products do have potential to drift, especially when conditions favor that. A variety of factors, including weather conditions, wind direction, wind speed, temperature, and relative humidity, and method of application, i.e. on the ground, can influence pesticide drift. The applicator must evaluate all factors and make appropriate adjustments when applying this product. Droplet size. This can be important. This can influence how and when you make your application. You may choose a different nozzle to make sure you're minimizing your drift based on wind conditions, etc. When applying sprays that contain 2,4-D as the sole active ingredient, or when applying sprays that contain 2,4-D mixed with active ingredients that require a coarse or coarser spray, apply only as a coarse or coarser spray. ASAE Standard 572 going to be a nozzle size or a volume mean diameter of 385 microns or greater for spinning atomizer nozzles. I don't think anybody's using spinning atomizer nozzles, but that tells you how you can and cannot apply it. Uh, and then you move on to your next one. So if you need a medium and more for, uh, fine spray. That then as we move down, we see wind speed. Wind speed can affect drift, right? So they have a section here that covers it. Do not apply at wind speeds greater than 15 miles an hour. So there we go. We've got a label restriction on specific wind speeds. If you're greater than 15 miles an hour, do not apply. Only apply this product if the wind direction favors on target deposition. And there are not sensitive areas, including but not limited to residential areas, bodies of water, known habitat for non-target species, non-target crops within 250 feet downwind. So even if you're less than 15 miles an hour, you have to be cognizant of sensitive areas that may be within 250 feet downwind when choosing to use this herbicide. That's important. If applying a medium spray, leave one swath unsprayed at the downwind edge of the treated field. Temperature inversions. Temperature inversions exist, and let me tell you how I know, because I have done it. And I have done a tremendous amount of damage with triclopyr and temperature inversions. If applying at wind speeds less than three miles per hour, the applicator must determine if conditions of temperature inversion exist. Stable atmospheric conditions exist at or below nozzle height. Do not make applications into areas of temperature inversions or stable atmospheric conditions. The problem is with no wind and stable atmosphere, what may happen is it may cause the droplets to suspend with no wind movement and go nowhere for hours potentially and it would be tiny microscopic um, uh, droplets that just sit there and float if you've ever uh, seen a dust cloud where you get the waterfall effect when it falls and it begins to move and then it just kind of stays there suspended in the air that would be uh, something that could happen with this uh, herbicide so if you're dealing with extremely stable conditions this herbicide can be dangerous susceptible plants again we're talking about the types of plants, anything that's vegetative or 
uh, tree-like can all be damaged by this product because they're going to be uh, similar to like our um, our dicots. Uh, so those dicots are basically just large broadleaf weeds and would be susceptible to this product. Applicators must follow all state and local pesticide drift requirements regarding application of 2,4-D herbicides. So they're pretty standard for all 2,4-D products and they're saying you must follow these. All ground equipment must be properly maintained and calibrated using appropriate carriers or surrogates. Do not apply with a nozzle height greater than four feet above the canopy. So you think about that, your height of your nozzle cannot be higher than four feet. So you think about guys that are out there spraying lawns, you don't want to be spraying this into the air like this. You want to be spraying down. Um, and then you have your weeds control. Typically these weed control lists are not completely comprehensive, but they are a pretty good indicator of what can happen with it. Now this is a good one here. You see the star here and it says provide suppression and it talks is specifically about yellow nut sedge. This product is not designed to kill yellow nut sedge. Suppression is a very vague statement. What this means is that at one and a half ounces per thousand square feet, it will cause discoloration on that weed. It does not mean it will kill that weed. It will just discolor it. It also runs the same risk of discoloring Bermuda grass. It does not mean it will kill Bermuda grass, but it will provide somewhat of a suppressive effect. Therefore, they listed it on this label. Why? Probably to sound a little cooler than it actually is. After applying this product, many broadleaf weeds will begin to show visible signs of leaf curl within a few days. Some hard to control broadleaf weeds may require a second broadcast treatment in three to four weeks to spot treat makeup solution as listed below. And then we'll get into some, some mixing instructions here. It says that when you fill your tank with water, start agitating with the water, then add your concentrate and maintain agitation after mixing and filling up with the rest of your water. Keep it agitating. If you uh, stop applying this product, say you got a drive or uh, you let it sit in your garage, re-agitate before use. Uh, turf application directions. This is easy. Three to four pints per acre. If you need to find out what that is per thousand square feet, even though it gives you the answer right here, a lot of times it'll just give it to you in an acre. So we'll say four pints. How many fluid ounces are in a pint? 16 times four is 64 divided by, um, you divide uh, that by 43.5 and, uh, and that's where you get your you know, 1.5 from. Uh, the maximum use rate for most warm season grasses is three pints per acre. For exceptions, see listing of warm season grasses listed above. Make application using equipment that will ensure uniform coverage. Foliar sprays should be applied during warm weather when weeds are actively growing. You need to apply this to actively growing weeds. If it's under drought conditions, you probably will not kill the weed. You'll probably end up doing more damage to the turf grass than you will to the weed. Hard to control species are prevalent when applications are made in late summer, when weeds are mature, or during drought con conditions, use the higher rates. On mostly clode, uh, closely mowed golf course fairway bent grass, again, two pints now they're recommending in 20 to 240 gallons of water per acre. So this is telling you that uh, apply it at 240 gallons of water per acre and you're going to be applying two pints of concentrate. So that's 32 ounces. So you would mix uh, you know, basically 239 and three quarters of a gallon of water and then add two pints of your Momentum FX2. Uh, broadleaf weeds germinate at different times of the year. Only emerge weeds present at the time of application will be controlled by this product. It's not going to have a pre-emergent effect. It's only going to uh, uh, eliminate what is actively up and growing. Limitations. This is an important one. For ornamental turf, huh, uh, lawns, it specifies there, lawns. The maximum rate per application is 5.3 pints per acre limited to two applications per year. So if you're going to violate this, your maximum would be 5.3 pints per acre, two applications per year. The maximum seasonal rate is 10.6 pints per acre 
excluding spot treatments. So blanket applications here, you can apply 10.6 pints per acre. So keep that in mind, that is going to limit your number of broadcast applications you apply. At 10.6 pints per acre, that would give you approximately three blanket spray applications at uh, three pints per acre. Remember the high rate on cool season grasses is going to be four pints per acre. That leaves you with two blanket spray applications. If you did three, you would be at 12 pints per acre. So this would limit you to two. Standard volume broadcast applications. Apply three to four pints of this product and enough water to deliver 20 to 200 gallons of total spray mix per acre. So this is going to be your carrier volume. Um, and then it's going to give you a low volume broadcast application. So guys who use uh, permagreens, apply three to four pints of this product and enough that water to deliver from five to 40 gallons of total spray mixture. So you'd have the flexibility there to apply it as a low volume application or a standard volume application. Target his own applications or spot treatment using portable sprayers, one and a half, I mean 1.1 to 1.5 ounces to make one gallon of spray and apply it any time broadleaf weeds are actively growing. Apply it till the weed is wet, but not to the point of runoff. So if you're using a jet nozzle, a jet meaning it shoots a stream, you do not want to use that on with this herbicide. You want to use this herbicide with a fan nozzle that can wet the weed, but not to the point of runoff. Storage and disposal. People ask about how to store this. Look right here. Store in a secured warehouse or storage building. Keep this product secure. Do not allow kids or other people to have access to it. Do not store near open containers of herbicides and other pesticides. So if you've got open containers of herbicides and other pesticides, fertilizer, seed, do not put this product next to it because there's potential for it to absorb into that. Store at temperatures above 25F. That means it can get to the point of freezing. It will probably freeze uh, at 25F. If it does freeze, remix well before using. Sometimes it will not go back into suspension. Most of the time it will. Uh, containers should be open in well-ventilated areas. It tells you it is, gas is gaseous and it does have an odor. Keep container tightly sealed. Do not stack cardboard cases more than two pallets high. Do not store near open containers of fertilizer, seed, or other pesticides. Again, it can gas. It can absorb into other products. It tells you how to dispose of it. Um, Non-refillable containers, five gallons or less. Do not reuse or refill this container. Offer for recycling if available. If you do, triple rinse the container. And it gives you uh, uh, instructions on how to triple rinse it. Warranty. Again, this is a CYA from the manufacturer. Um, you can read this if you want, you probably don't, but this is going to tell you that if you violate anything that's stated in this, you're doing so at your own risk. And if any damages occur, the manufacturer has nothing to do with it. It is entirely on you. All right, everyone. So that is taking us through the entirety of this particular label here for Momentum FX2. Um, I hope by going through it line by line like that, it helps you understand that there are certain things that need to be interpreted into a label. There are many, many, many factors that need to be taken into consideration when choosing to use a product. And it shows you sections of the label that are important. And I don't know if you could tell by this, but 98% of it is extremely important. There is a lot of data and information here, and that's why it's important that we study the labels, learn the labels, pick up a label every time you go to spray the product, understand its limits, take into account waterways, drift potential, temperature, uh, potential for temperature inversion to take place. All of these can lead to a successful and then also a very unsuccessful application. Think about what period or state are your weeds in? Are they actively growing or are they going dormant from summer, summer heat or stress? Remember, a lot of broadleaves like cooler weather. So if you're getting to 90, 95 degrees and you're trying to apply this product, you're probably not going to have very good efficacy of it because it's not rated to be applied at temperatures that high. So again, not only does it apply to this herbicide, it applies to all herbicides. All right, everybody, I hope you learned something today. The next installment, we're gonna actually start moving into actual herbicides that I have out there, and we're gonna talk about how to mix them, 
Um, each individual herbicide I have in my possession, use rates, everything listed above. All right, everybody, appreciate it. Y'all have a good one. Take it easy.